Welcome, I am your host, and this is the Unanswered Questions Podcast. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of my new podcast, Unanswered Questions, where every week we will endeavour to discuss a mysterious unsolved case that has many lingering unanswered questions. So I hope you enjoy and as always leave me some feedback on what you think about the show and rate it as well. This week we'll be talking about Oleg Pinkovsky. So Oleg Vladimirovich Pinkovsky, born 23rd of April 1919 and died allegedly on the 16th of May 1963, USSR codenamed Hero, was a colonel with Soviet military intelligence GRU during the 1950s and early 1960s who informed the United Kingdom and the United States about the Soviet emplacement of missiles in Cuba. Now we get into his early life and military career. So, Pinkovsky's father died as an officer in the White Army in the Russian Civil War. Pinkovsky graduated from the Kiev Artillery Academy in the rank of lieutenant in 1939. After taking part in the Winter War against Finland and in World War II, he had reached the rank of lieutenant colonel. A GRU officer, Pinkovsky was appointed military attaché in Ankara, Turkey in 1955. He later worked at the Soviet Committee for Scientific Research, and Pinkovsky was a personal friend of GRU head Ivan Surov and Soviet Marshal Sergei Varintsov. Now we get into the controversy surrounding whether he worked for or against Western intelligence because there are two minds of thought on this. Because there are two very different opinions about Oleg Pinkovsky. While the majority of observers seem to feel that he was a genuine defector, as described in the Pinkovsky papers, Peter Wright, a scientist with MI5 in Britain, was convinced that Pinkovsky was a Soviet plant designed to lead the United States to the conclusion that the USSR's intercontinental ballistic missile capabilities were much less developed than they actually were. The defector account says Pinkovsky approached American students on the, and I'm going to butcher this name, Moskvortsky Bridge in Moscow in July of 1960 and gave them a package which was delivered to the Central Intelligence Agency. CIA officers delayed in contacting him because they believed they were under constant surveillance. Pankovsky eventually persuaded the British spy Greville Wynne to arrange a meeting with two American and two British intelligence officers during a visit to London in 1961. Wynne became one of his couriers, and in his autobiography, Wynne says that he was carefully developed by British intelligence over many years with the specific task of making contact with Pankovsky. The CIA regretted their earlier mistake, but were included by the British and they shared future information. For the following 18 months, Pankovsky supplied a tremendous amount of information to his British secret intelligence service handlers in Moscow, Rory and Janet Chisholm, and to CIA and SIS contacts during his permitted trips abroad. Most significantly, he was responsible for arming President John F. Kennedy with the information that the Soviet nuclear arsenal was much smaller than previously thought, that the Soviet fueling systems were not fully operational, and that the Soviet guidance systems were not yet functional. The view of Peter Wright, however, is quite different. Wright was struck by the fact that unlike Igor Guzenko and other earlier defectors, Pankovsky did not reveal the names of any illegal Soviet agents in the West, but confined himself to organizational detail, much of which was known already. Wright noted that some of the documents were originals, which in his opinion would not have been so easily taken from their sources. Wright scathingly condemned the leadership of British intelligence throughout nearly the whole Cold War period. He reportedly believed that the Soviet agents, Philby, McLean, Burgess and Blunt, could all have been identified more quickly using the scientific methods that he proposed. In Wright's view, British intelligence leaders became even more paralysed when Philby and the others defectors of the Soviet Union. British intelligence became so fearful of another fiasco that they avoided taking risks. Aware of this sensitivity, Wright says the Soviets planted Pinkovsky to buoy up the sagging fortunes of their ineffective and therefore highly useful counterparts in British intelligence. Wright wrote, and I quote, When I first wrote my Pinkovsky analysis, Morris Oldfield, later chief of MI6 in the 1970s, who played a key role in the Pinkovsky case as chief of station in Washington, told me, You've got a long row to hoe with this one, Peter. There's a lot of Ks, knighthoods, and gongs, medals, riding high on the back of Pinkovsky, he said, referring to the honors heaped on those involved in the Pinkovsky operation, end quote. Wright was more complimentary of the CIA and even of the FBI, who were initially suspicious and remained suspicious of Pinkovsky. Greville Wynne seems convinced that Pinkovsky was genuine and that Wynne's own sacrifices, including 18 months in the Lubyanka prison, were worthwhile. 
Former KGB Major General Oleg Kalugin does not once mention Pinkovsky in his comprehensive book. KGB defector Vladimir Sakharov suggests Pinkovsky was genuine, saying, and I quote, I knew about the ongoing KGB reorganization precipitated by Oleg Pinkovsky's case and Yuri Nisenko's defection. Yuri Nisenko, I have actually covered on another episode of this podcast. The party was not satisfied with KGB performance. I knew many heads in the KGB had rolled again, as they had with Stalin. End quote. While the weight of opinion seems to be Pinkovsky was genuine, the debate underscores the difficulty faced by all intelligence agencies of separating fact from fiction. Now we get into Pinkovsky's role in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now, Soviet leadership started the deployment of nuclear missiles in the belief that Washington could not detect the Cuban missile sites until it was too late to do anything about them. Pinkovsky provided plans and descriptions of the nuclear rocket launch sites on Cuba. Only, this information allowed the West to identify the missile sites from the low-resolution pictures provided by US U-2 spy planes. Former GRU colonel and defector Viktor Suvarov writes, and I quote, and historians will remember with gratitude the name of the GRU Colonel Oleg Pinkovsky. Thanks to his priceless information, the Cuban Missile Crisis was not transformed into a last world war. End quote. Now we get into Pinkovsky's arrest and death. So it remains unclear to this day exactly how Pinkovsky was found out. One theory links his arrest to the spouse of a contact. Janet Chisholm's husband, Yuri Chisholm, worked with a man named George Blake, who happened coincidentally to be a KGB agent. It's thought that once Blake implicated Pinkovsky, the KGB began watching him from apartments across the river from his home and confirmed he was meeting with Western intelligence. Another story had it that Pinkovsky's activities were revealed by Jack Dunlap, a double agent working for the KGB. The KGB swiftly drew the conclusion that there was a mole in their ranks and set about uncovering him. Pinkovsky's American contacts received a letter from Pinkovsky notifying them that a Moscow dead drop had been loaded. Upon servicing the dead drop, the American handler was arrested, signaling that Pinkovsky had been apprehended by Soviet authorities. Pinkovsky was arrested on the 22nd of October 1962 before Kennedy's address to the nation revealing the U-2 spy plane photographs had confirmed intelligence reports and that the Soviets were installing medium-range nuclear missiles on the Caribbean island, codenamed Operation Anandur. Thus, President Kennedy was deprived of a potentially important intelligence agent that might have lessened the tension during the ensuing 13-day standoff, intelligence such as the fact that Nikita Khrushchev was already looking for ways to defuse the situation. Such information arguably would have reduced the pressure on Kennedy to launch an invasion on the island, an action which, it is now known, might have led to the use of lunar-class tactical nuclear weapons against U.S. troops. The Soviet commander, General Issa A. Plyev, commander in charge, had been given permission to use these weapons without consulting Moscow first. Now we get into the fate of Pinkovsky. So, Pinkovsky was executed, but there are conflicting reports about the manner of his death. He is said to have been convicted of treason and espionage in a trial in 1963. Some sources allege Pinkovsky was executed by the traditional Soviet method of a bullet to the back of the neck, cremated, and his ashes buried in the new Donskoy Cemetery in Moscow. Alexander Zagovdin, chief KGB interrogator for the investigation, stated that Pinkovsky had been, and I quote, questioned perhaps a hundred times, end quote, and that he had been shot and cremated. However, former MI5 officer Peter Wright believed Pinkovsky was actually a double agent who, having completed his task of taking in the Western intelligence services, was, after a show trial, awarded a suitable post out of sight in the Soviet Union. This, claims Wright, explains why Pinkovsky never defected to the West when he had the chance. Then we have the noted Soviet sculptor Ernest Nizemsky, who said that he had been told by the director of the Donskoy Cemetery Crematorium how Pinkovsky had been executed by fire. Now, this is backed up somewhat by GRU agent Vladimir Ruzan, known for his controversial book under the pseudonym Viktor Suvorov, following his defection from the Soviet Union to the United Kingdom. He alleged in his book Aquarium to have been shown a black and white film in which a GRU colonel was bound to a stretcher and cremated alive in a furnace as a warning to potential traitors. And since Pinkovsky is the only known executed GRU colonel, this description was attributed by many to his fate. A similar description of the process was later included in Ernst Volkmann's popular book and Tom Clancy's novel Red Rabbit. However, Sovrov, in an interview, later denied that the man in the film was Pinkovsky and said that he had been shot. 
Greville Wynn, in his book The Man from Odessa, claimed that Penkovsky killed himself. Wynn had also worked as both Penkovsky's contact and courier. Both men were arrested by the Soviets in October of 1962. The Soviet public was first told of Penkovsky's arrest more than seven weeks later when Pravada named Wynn and Jacob as his contacts without naming anyone else. In May of 1963, after his trial, Izvestia reported that Varenstov, who had since achieved the rank of Chief Marshal of Artillery and Commander-in-Chief of Rocket Forces and candidate member of the Central Committee, had been demoted to the rank of Major General. In June, he was expelled from the Central Committee for having relaxed his political vigilance. Three other officers were also disciplined. The head of the GRU, Ivan Surov, was sacked during the same period. He was reputedly on friendly terms with Penkovsky, which is very likely to have been a cause of his fall. With that, this case remains open, but with many unanswered questions, it still remains unanswered. Please rate the show and let me know what you guys think about this and the many other cases I have covered. You can follow me on all major social media platforms, YouTube, BitChute, Dailymotion. I'm also on Twitter and Instagram. Links are all down below in the description. If you have a case you'd like me to have a look at or cover, don't hesitate to send me a message. I'm your host, and this has been the Unanswered Questions Podcast. Until next time. Next on unanswered questions. On the 17th of December 1967, Harold Holt, the Prime Minister of Australia at the time, disappeared while swimming in the sea near Port Sea, Victoria. 